Helicopter aviation has arrived only recently upon the military scene, with the first successful test flight taking place after the start of World War II. Today, the United States Army operates a large and diversified fleet of rotary wing aircraft. The H-21, for example, is a light cargo helicopter. It has a range and speed comparable to those of many fixed wing aircraft and can carry up to 20 men or an equivalent weight of cargo. This helicopter has a tandem rotor configuration with both rotors contributing lift and thrust. The H-34 is another light cargo helicopter. It has a main rotor for lift and thrust, plus a tail rotor to counteract engine torque. Its performance characteristics are good. At a later stage of training, you may learn to fly both the H-21 and the H-34. Until now, most of you have trained entirely in reconnaissance-type helicopters, like the H-13. You have learned how to prepare it for flight and how to perform its standard maneuvers. You are undoubtedly aware of its capabilities and limitations. It is slow, has a short range, and carries a small load as compared with larger helicopters. The reconnaissance type, however, remains an excellent aircraft for many purposes. It is standard equipment for military surveillance and various other missions. It has proven itself indispensable in frontline medical evacuations. The H-23 is also a reconnaissance type helicopter. Many of you have already checked out on this aircraft and found its operating characteristics very similar to those of the H-13. Both are used as primary trainers. You are now ready to go into heavier aircraft. The Army operates two helicopters in the utility class. You may learn to fly both. The H-19 is slightly larger than the H-25. It has a single main rotor and a tail rotor to counteract engine torque. The utility helicopters are more versatile than the reconnaissance type. They can carry much greater loads and go farther without refueling. They are also faster and less affected by adverse weather conditions. Let's see how you make the transition to the H-19 using the D model for demonstration purposes. In making your transition, there are eight main steps to consider. Pre-flight inspection, cockpit procedure, taxiing, hovering, takeoff, auto rotation, approach, and engine shutdown. You start your pre-flight inspection in the cockpit. Steps are provided on either side of the fuselage, or you may enter from the cargo compartment. There is much more to inspect on the H-19 than on the reconnaissance type helicopter, so you will be shown only the main steps of a pre-flight. To make sure the aircraft is cleared for flight, first examine Form 781. Next, turn on the battery and miscellaneous inverter switches to check the fuel quantity in both the fore and aft gas tanks. Then turn off both switches. Release the rotor brake to enable you to turn the rotor head later on during its inspection. That's all in the cockpit at this time. The next area to check is the cabin. All cabin equipment must be inspected carefully. Start with a fixed light. The switches should be in the off position. The fire extinguisher should be in place, secure, and indicate proper pressure. Now, proceeding in a clockwise fashion around the cabin, check the condition of the passenger seats and safety belts on the right side. Then see that the heater damper control is in its proper position. Next, check the baggage compartment. To remove the door and to prevent damage, Carefully release all four fasteners. 
Visually, check the inside of the compartment. Make sure there are no loose articles that may cause damage. See that it has not been excessively loaded. When you replace the door, make certain that all fasteners are secure. The first aid kits must be secure and properly sealed. Check the handle of the emergency escape hatch and the general security of the hatch itself. Then check the seats and safety belts on the left side. The cabin inspection may vary with different auxiliary equipment, but in any case be certain that everything is secure. After completing your inspection of the cabin, open the two clamshell doors which house the engine compartment. Don't let go of the doors until they are securely fastened. They could be damaged by wind or the downwash of another helicopter. Check the left side of the nose section first. Make sure that the fire warning system on the door is secure and not damaged. Then check the left nose gear for damage, condition of the self-centering device, correct strut extension, and proper inflation of the tire. Now for the engine and its accessories. Inspect all hoses, connections, safeties, and check the security and proper mounting of all attached components. Look for loose or damaged parts and for excessive oil leakage. Check the right side of the engine and right landing gear in the same manner as you did on the left. With this phase of the inspection completed, secure the clamshell doors. Now on the right side of the aircraft, look into the clutch compartment through the air ducts. Check for excessive oil leakage and condition of hydraulic lines. The oil tank filler is located on this side. Make sure that the oil is at a proper level. Then secure the filler cap. Also check the security of the filler cap for the forward fuel tank. Now try the movement of the cargo door and see that it latches securely. On the right main gear, check the slippage marks and the tire for proper inflation. Check for any leaks in the brake and in the hydraulic line. See that the shock struts are extended to the proper length. Then check the security of the filler cap on the aft fuel tank. As you continue around the aircraft, observe the general condition of the skin. Look for cracks, dents, and missing rivets. Remove the access panel on the right side to inspect the battery and other installed equipment. Make sure that the circuit breakers are correctly set. Replace and secure the panel. Make certain each fastener is properly positioned. Visually, check the condition of the tail boom and antenna as you proceed aft. Observe the general condition of the tail pylon. Make sure that the right stabilizer and tail guard are secure and undamaged. Inspect the control cables and check for oil leakage from the intermediate gearbox. Look through the inspection window at the base of the pylon to check the oil level in the intermediate gearbox. In the same manner, check the oil level in the tail rotor gearbox. Then inspect the condition of the tail rotor blades and the pitch change mechanism. Since it is impractical to examine them closely, be sure your visual check is thorough. Continue the inspection on the left side of the aircraft. On this side, just as on the right, check the tail pylon, stabilizer, tail boom, antenna, and fuselage. On this side, you also check the static port and heater exhaust for obstructions and the upper aft strut pin for freedom of movement. Next, inspect the left main landing gear in the same manner as you did the right. Also, the static ground wire, which is on this side. When you complete this, crawl under the fuselage and drain some gasoline from the aft tank to check for water and foreign matter. The cargo sling should be properly stowed. 
Check the forward tank for water and foreign matter. Next, climb up the left side of the helicopter for your rotor head and blade check. The window must be partially closed to enable you to let down the service platform. Now for the head assemblies. On each, check the pitch change link for tolerance, anti-flap restrainer for freedom of movement, star plate for free movement and tolerance, and blade lock for position and safety. Make sure the damper is not binding and that the fluid in its reservoir is at the proper level. Next, turn the rotor to check for freedom of movement and general condition of the blades. Inspect each head assembly in the same manner as before, looking for damage, cracks, and excessive wear. Through the window aft of the cockpit, check the oil level of the main gearbox and servo reservoir. Also look for signs of excessive oil or fluid leakage. That completes your inspection on the left side. As you climb down, secure the service platform. Then return to the right side of the aircraft and climb to the cockpit. Check the condition of the right cockpit window and service platform. Now for the pitot tube. Remove the cover and inspect its general condition. That completes your outside inspection, so enter the cockpit. In the H-19, the right side is the pilot side. Before fastening the safety belt, remember to adjust your shoulder harness, an added safety feature on this aircraft. The ends of the harness are looped to the safety belt fastener. Next, put on your headset. Now to check the flight controls for freedom of movement. They are the same controls you used on the H-13. Cyclic, pitch, throttle. After checking it, leave it closed. And finally, anti-torque pedals. Set the fuel selector switch to the fullest tank. The mixture control on the right of the quadrant is set full back to idle cutoff. The other levers are set full forward. Make sure the rotor brake is released. Turn on the battery and correct fuel pump switches, then the flight and miscellaneous inverter switches. Prime your engine. Then with the starter, turn the engine through a complete revolution before starting. This is your check for hydrostatic lock. After completing your starting procedures, increase engine RPM to 1700 and turn on the clutch pump switch. As the clutch starts to engage, engine RPM will fall and the rotor will start turning. Advance the throttle and raise engine RPM to between 1800 and 2000. Hold it there while the rotor continues to engage. When rotor RPM is risen to approximately 130, reduce throttle until the engine needle falls slightly below the rotor needle. Mechanical coupling will engage at this point. To complete the coupling, increase engine RPM until the needles join. Turn off the clutch pump switch and maintain engine RPM at 1700 for two minutes. This gives enough time for the oil to drain from the clutch. Then increase your engine RPM to 2000 for your servo check. In order to make this test, turn off the servo switch. The cyclic should offer resistance, but not bind. Turn the servo switch back on and again check the cyclic. It should operate smoothly and easily and without vibration. Next, make a normal magneto check just as on the H-13. After completing your mag check, close the throttle momentarily to split the needles. This is to test the freewheeling unit. Now join the needles and bring the engine to its operating RPM, 2350. Then as soon as the chocks are removed, you are ready for the first maneuver, 
taxiing. With pitch full down, release the parking brake and set the cyclic slightly forward. The helicopter may start moving now. If not, as in this instance, it may be necessary to apply a slight amount of pitch to get started. As it moves forward, control your speed with cyclic and brakes. A helicopter with wheels requires a very small amount of pitch for taxiing. Maintain operating RPM for good control and to enable a takeoff in event of emergency. Turns are made primarily with the pedals. However, by applying brake on the side toward which you are turning, a sharper turn can be made. Remember to use a minimum of pitch. However, if the main rotor should start to bump against its stops, you have applied too much forward cyclic. Eliminate this bumping by moving the cyclic slightly toward the rear. The more advanced wheel and brake system of the H-19 makes taxiing and turning easier than in helicopters equipped with skids. Therefore, it is generally more practical to taxi rather than hover, as you would in a reconnaissance type helicopter. Apply foot brakes evenly on both sides when you want to stop. Before all takeoffs, a pre-takeoff check is made. All flight controls are tested for smoothness of operation. Engine, fuel and transmission instruments are checked for readings within their proper operating range. Also check flight instruments and radio. To take off to a hover, start with pitch down, cyclic in neutral. Then bring the engine up to operating RPM and slowly increase pitch until the helicopter reaches a hovering altitude. Normally, this will be between 5 and 10 feet. The H-19 pedals offer more resistance than on lighter helicopters. Hovering to the rear should be avoided because of limited visibility. Other than this, the H-19 can be made to perform all the hovering maneuvers which you learned in other helicopters. Hovering turns are made with the pedals. Avoid fast rates of turn, since too much stress can damage the tail pylon. The H-19 can make a normal takeoff either from a hover or directly from the ground. From a hover, the takeoff is essentially the same as in an H-13. Be sure to avoid an excessive nose-low attitude. Now let's take a look at a normal takeoff directly from the ground. Generally employed with critical loads and under some confined area conditions, it requires good coordination and timing. Begin this maneuver at operating RPM. Smoothly apply pitch as you add throttle to hold your RPM. As you break ground, the helicopter should pivot and move immediately into forward flight. Again, be sure to avoid an excessive nose-low attitude. As you gain effective translational lift, level and establish a normal climb. When you first practice auto-rotations in an H-19, you should make a power recovery. Enter auto rotation at 500 feet at an airspeed of 60 knots. As in other helicopters, start the auto rotation by lowering pitch and reducing throttle. Add a slight amount of throttle to keep the engine running smoothly. If rotor RPM becomes excessive, it may be necessary to add a small amount of pitch. Maintain airspeed at 50 to 60 knots during auto rotation. To prevent a high rate of descent, only flare auto rotations are made in an H-19. When you are 50 to 75 feet above the ground, flare the helicopter to dissipate airspeed, stop your rate of descent, and increase your rotor RPM. After leveling the helicopter, make a normal power recovery at a hovering altitude. Once this is mastered, the next step is to learn to auto rotate to the ground. Touchdown should be made in a slightly tail low attitude and with forward speed. 
As you gain greater proficiency, slower touchdowns should be made to prepare for landing on rough surfaces in emergencies. To make a normal approach in an H-19, you follow the same general procedures you learned in your primary flight training. However, the difference in weight and speed of this aircraft will place a higher requirement on your planning and judgment. This is especially noticeable when turning into the final approach. Practice will develop accuracy. Start your approach when you reach a 12 degree angle. Maintain 55 knots during the first third of the approach. Then gradually dissipate speed and altitude. Apply sufficient power to complete the approach at a slow rate of closure. Approaches can be made at a hover, but are better directly to the ground. Touchdown is made with little or no forward motion. When your flight is completed, taxi to the designated parking area. After parking, you are ready to start your standard engine shutdown procedure. Apply tow brakes firmly on both pedals and set the parking brake. Perform a normal magneto check as you did in your starting procedure. After the mag check, Reduce engine RPM to about 1100. When rotor RPM is down to approximately 110, the clutch will disengage automatically. Make sure the droop stops have dropped into position before continuing the shutdown. Then idle the engine until cylinder head temperature is below 150 degrees and move the mixture control to idle cutoff. When rotor RPM drops below 80, apply the rotor brake gently to stop the rotor. Lock the brake with one rotor blade forward. Finally, starting at the top of the main switch panel and working down, set all of the switches in their proper shutdown positions. Place the fuel selector switch in the off position. Your shutdown procedure is complete. Now fill out your flight report. After entering your flight time, turn to the back of part two. If any defects are found during flight, make sure to enter them here. And sign off your flight. The H-19 is one of the most widely used Army helicopters. This utility aircraft has many advantages over the smaller reconnaissance helicopters with which you are already familiar. Its operation, however, is essentially the same. Now let's review the main points we covered in making the transition to the H-19. Learn to make the pre-flight inspection systematically and thoroughly. Correct cockpit procedure ensures a safe start. Taxiing on wheels isn't difficult if you keep pitch to a minimum. Hovering is generally the same as in smaller helicopters, but used less often. In a takeoff, avoid excessive nose-low attitude. A flare autorotation is the only type used in an H-19. Your approach should be slow and well under power for accuracy and precision. Learn the correct engine shutdown procedure to make sure nothing is overlooked or forgotten. In transition, as in your earlier training, your most valuable tools are firm procedure and a positive technique.